All right, we're rolling. Okay, um, let's go ahead and introduce ourselves. Ming, let's start with you. All right, this is Ming from the Mideast uh, Research Center. Uh, so uh, my background, I, you know, I, I, I was, I am an engineer uh, in the IT industry uh, for many years. Uh, in recent years, uh, I was in the blockchain uh, sector and uh, been through a uh, couple projects. Uh, so right now, um, the uh, well, I would say I'm the coordinator for the uh, Mideast Research uh, Center. And today, uh, we want to discuss the DAC economy. Awesome. Thank you. Pavel, you want to introduce yourself? Sure, sure. So my name is Pavel. I am currently the integration lead at Metis. I've been in the Ethereum ecosystem since roughly 2017. I've led educational workshops and presentations describing just more of like the educational sector, you know, what Ethereum is, and uh, a bit about the technical portions as well. And I currently assist all projects in all stages of development that are currently building on the Mitis platform. Awesome, thank you. I'm glad you all are here today. Um, let's kind of get started with a little explanation um, of what the Mitis Research Center is and uh, what the focus of, of the study is going to be. You're right. Do you want to take that one, Ming? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, uh, Media's Research Center is coordinating uh, research efforts in in the uh, uh, broad uh, Media's community, uh, you know, technology-wise and as well as uh, societal and economic-wise. So, um, so our task is to uh, promote research and also education. Uh, in, 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 in the broader uh, blockchain sector, as well as, uh, you know, promoting the, uh, the new uh, economic uh, reach that uh, the blockchain economy would, uh, you know, permeate through the, you know, the society. Uh, so this is, this is sort of like our mission here at the Midis. But the Midis Research Center is not just about Midi's project, it's actually much broader. And then DAC economy is uh, the center uh, of a um, vision of Midi's uh, that, you know, we're not just for uh, finance, uh, for, uh, for example, for, uh, the, you know, the financial aspect of blockchain and crypto, but also like uh, the uh, applications in societal and other parts of the economy. Awesome, thank you. Um, so before we get into like what a DAC is and kind of the vision for that, I want to back up a little bit for people who are really new to this space. Um, Pablo, when we were in ETH Denver, you led a talk on the evolution of DAOs into DAC kind of infrastructure. Can you explain a little bit of what a DAO is and then we'll move into uh, DACs? Sure. So a DAO, I would like to imagine it as a internet community with a shared bank account. That is basically as a very, I would say meme answer. Uh, a DAO can be much, much more, it can be, uh, but that is, in this sense, the minimum, where the community decides where the bank account funds go, uh, who gets paid, uh, and any type of reward distribution or promotion gets handled by the members of, of a DAO. In this case, a DAO is very fluid, it's a flat organizational structure. So everyone has a voice 
everyone is able to contribute and provide their own external skills. So a content creator can come in and they can create YouTube videos, but maybe promoting the DAO. And a developer can come in and provide more of the technical infrastructure on how the rewards would be distributed. And many, many, many more, I would say, community contributions could be based off of a DAO-like structure. So it is a flat organizational structure by default. Typically, there is, um, typically for all DAOs, well, not all, most DAOs, uh, there is a form of token-based governance. So people are able to uh, get governance tokens and vote on specific proposals that would be enacted. Uh, and in that case, there could be much, much more, I would say, say or voice in uh, an individual's uh, ability to direct on where a DAO can go. And I guess that that's uh, a brief summary, just an overview of a DAO. Um, and there is, of course, many, many types of DAOs that are out there, and many, many, and not all DAOs, again, are coin-covered DAOs. Um, but in this case, there is a lot of DAOs that are, that are in the ecosystem that range from food-based DAOs to uh, to, you know, like Pizza DAO, to, I guess, community funded uh, investments DAOs, uh, all the way to maybe just something for the financial sector as well. So there's, and, and charities as well. So there's, there's tons of, of, uh, of DAOs and community flourishes from basically having this ability to spin up a community uh, that has any form of cause to it. Yeah, that's that's a brief overview. Thank you. Yeah, so a DAO, I can't remember if you said this, but it's a decentralized autonomous organization. That's what DAO stands for, D-A-O. Um, but we talked a little bit in, or you talked a little bit in your presentation about some of the limitations of a DAO structure and how we can really think about expanding the functionalities of decentralized organizations beyond um, governance. And so that's kind of where the DAC structure comes in. So Ming, would you mind explaining uh, what DAC stands for and, and what your vision for the function of that could be in a new kind of economy? Yeah, sure. Um, so the origin of DAC, actually, uh, Pavel explained that in his talk at East Denver. Uh, that was a decentralized autonomous corporation. Uh, so it's a corporation that existed on the blockchain um, and governed by smart contracts. And of course, the, uh, the coins, the cryptos that come with the, you know, the, the blockchain smart contracts. So this is, this is what, uh, what a decentralized autonomous corporation is all about. It's uh, moving or uh, creating a, an alternative or parallel uh, governance structure, right? The the laws uh, that exist in our society, right? The laws that was established by decrees, by uh, uh, you know, uh, just you know, by regulation sometimes, uh, and of course also by its own bylaws, you know, governance uh, structure, and uh, and blockchain smart contracts are all about uh, what used to be called uh, code is law, so. Uh, so this parallel structure uh, would be transferred that, uh, uh, you know, law and uh, set of uh, statutes into code. So this is this is sort of the understanding of a DAC. So and this is the the kind of understanding existed like, I think since the very early days of blockchain and probably some of those thoughts are like even before, uh, even before the first crypto was created. You know that the ideas you know. Uh, kind of goes way back. Uh, so here in uh, Midi's uh, DAC, uh, it's still called DAC, uh, but we, we changed a word uh, from corporation to company. Uh, and it's not, it's not just uh, just one word, it's, it's a different way of looking at uh, these organizations, even it's called decentralized. Uh, because the 
uh, the nature of uh, any organization is is usually about its boundary. So uh, in order to form something like a, a cluster of people, uh, you know, governed by some even uh, laws or statutes or bylaws, uh, you need a you need a boundary, right? Um, and with boundary comes a membership. So uh, so this part is the same. This part, um, even if you use the word decentralized, if the boundary uh, is not at the individual, right? You need a membership. Uh, blockchain or crypto or smart contracts uh, would just copy that structure. Uh, so at DAC economy, at uh, Midis, we uh, promote an, like another parallel uh, structure, which we call in individual centric uh, DAO, uh, which is individual centric DAC.com. You know, it's decentralized autonomous uh, company. Uh, instead of uh, decentralized uh, autonomous corporation that core, so you know there's a diff there's, so there's a difference. So that core uh, is uh, very similar to the original uh, you know cluster of people with a boundary defined by laws or even uh, structures outside of law, right? Uh, like a firewall, right? That's uh, so you need to have a boundary that's uh, beyond people, beyond individual. In an individual-centric uh, DAC, the boundary is at the individual level, right? So, you know, the organization is not a, like a shell, like a container, it's more like a label, right? So this way, the, the major difference is that uh, individual is at the center, so everyone, uh, every other structure re resolves, uh, revolves around the individual. Uh, for example, it's very easy for individual centric DAC or DACOM to uh, you can you can wear as many as these lab labels, right? It's very easy because the boundary is just a you, right? So you can wear them as you know badges or flags or hats or skins. So it's it's very easy. Uh, and on the country, you know the traditional uh, DACOR or or DAO, uh, even though it has the uh, smart contracts to govern uh, its structure, uh, you still have a very hard boundary, right? The boundary may not be uh, enforced by, uh, you know, physical boundary, but, you know, you would have a, a boundary maybe by your coin, uh, maybe by a certain uh, contracts, smart contract code that establish that boundary. So, um, so this is the major difference. And I think we are pushing the idea of centralization even further. And uh, so uh, the ramification of this idea uh, becomes the center of the uh, vision of the METIS. Uh, but it's not just uh, the METIS project. It's, uh, I think it's at the core of uh, promote the, uh, you know, the, you know, the kind of the uh, uh, central tenor of the whole blockchain revolution which is decentralization. Uh, so not just the coin level, right? Uh, because the coin, the crypto, uh, that's a one way to see value. So by putting individual at the center, uh, they're you know, exciting new ways to define and to uh, uh, you know, broaden the reach of blockchain into every parts of the society. So, um, so uh, just, at least at the start, this is what the economy is all about. So, you know, so we're also here to uh, sort of redefine value, right? Is value just the crypto or more? More meaning more ways of, for people to interact. Because value is actually basically what people interact with each other, right? It's not, it's not just paper, of course, not some, not some metal coins. Uh, again, it's also probably not just uh, some 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 contracts, right? You know, uh, so yeah, so we call it like the second uh, blockchain revolution, uh, which this is all about. So. Yeah, this this is this is uh, the me? start. Yeah, <laughs> this is start of uh, what we mean by uh, DAC economy and uh, why that economy as uh, so we see it as a second uh, blockchain revolution.
Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I was on mute for a second. <laughs> um, so I would like to hear both of your perspectives on what makes something truly decentralized. Like, what does it mean for an organization to be decentralized? So let's start with you, Ming, and then we'll uh, we'll get Pavel's feedback. Sure. Uh, my understanding of decentralization is uh, about you know people about individuals. So uh, if something uh, is decentralized, meaning the decision maker is the individual. So that's why we put uh, the phrase individual centric at the uh, center of our understanding of anything decentralized. Uh, because you know you, you can't just put the word decentralized in front of anything that's essentially like uh, centralized and just call it decentralized, right? Um, so you know you, you have to see from an individual first uh, point of view. So this is this is you know uh, our understanding of decentralization. Go ahead, Pavel. Thank yeah, you, me. I, I guess I can I can expand on that idea. I think decentralization is a very big quality, especially within the Ethereum ecosystem or any, I would say, blockchain ecosystem. It's it's really, if you ask anybody on the street, what is decentralization? Uh, what does it mean to them? You'll have different answers from everyone. I mean, as long as they don't consult the dictionary. But in this case, what decentralization means to me is that if I make an action, if I do any sort of action, I cannot change the outcome of that action no matter what I do in, in my power. So in this, in this case, if I make a transaction on the blockchain, I cannot revert that transaction even if it is my sole goal or purpose in life to remove that transaction. And so that is what I think decentralization means, is that even if someone pointed a, a gun to my head and said revert this transaction, I, I literally say I, I literally can't. And in terms of the decentralized ecosystem, a lot, a lot of parts, I think, are still centralized, which isn't bad. It, it isn't, you know, centralization, I guess, has this connotation where it's, where it's like, oh, well, if it's centralized, then it's bad. Well, there's also the part of decentralization where you know, no one has that responsibility or, or accountability for these actions. And I think that's, in this case, you can implement a process where, although it is in some cases centralized, if, if you say that if your version, version of decentralized, decentralization means that a oh, well, single person controls the operation, um, in, in the case of where my views on decentralization is, is, is that although one person can control it, everyone can see the actions and the results of those actions, and the person cannot change it. And I think that that is where, that even though you can have some centralized processes and procedures, but because anybody can see those actions or your actions in, 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 the, in the ecosystem, that, that holds you to that accountability that accountability and since you cannot change the results of those actions that's what makes it decentralized and and anyone can come in and attest to that can verify that and that it's immutable and transparent and that that is what uh, that aspect of decentralization is that it's not just you know that one term it's it's that immutability it's that transparency and it's that verifiability i think that that is what makes uh, decentralization key yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. I know that I had a lot of conversations about decentralization when we were in Denver, and I think the definition that I arrived to that seemed to make the most sense, no matter who I talked to, was um, a redistribution of like power and ownership. Um, 
And I also thought it was really interesting to have conversations about what the limitations of a decentralized organization were, what a DAO is, because of that lack of individual ownership. Um, So it can be great for transparency and accountability, but also um, if, if no one's in charge, then no one's in charge. And so it's like up to people to really be sure that they are educating themselves on what's going on in the organization and then offering, um, staying engaged. And so I think the idea of moving into DAC structure offers a little more customization and what things um, we need to be more automated and and governed by a contract um, and what things can be a little more open to community participation. Uh, Ming, you talked a little bit about a different perspective of value. Could you say a little bit more on that? Yes, sure. Um, so I think the uh, people's under, uh, understanding of a governance on blockchain uh, which is at the center of a um, you know very intuitive DAO, is that it's governed uh, by code instead of law, which code is the uh, codification of people's understanding of some rules, right? So uh, I think, but I think that part uh, actually corresponds to the autonomous part, right? You have a machine that's running a set of uh, code uh, that's authored uh, or uh, programmed by uh, uh, by people, so uh, so in that in that in that way, uh, the will of whoever authored that code will be manifested in the outcome, right? And of course, with blockchain and and the code, uh, there's transparency because the result is uh, recorded on the blockchain for everyone to see and check, audit, uh, and it's executed uh, without ever, you know, without. Uh, Interference. So that's the I, that's the idea of uh, blockchain in the first place. Uh, but I think um, in terms of value, uh, you know, we can probably uh, drill deeper, right? Because we have ways uh, to organize our business. Uh, our history is about uh, you know people organize themselves to a central goal, right? That's this uh, you know saber tooth. Uh, uh, you know, animal. You know, we want their meat, uh, but we're you know we're we're not so powerful to overwhelm them. So we need a tribe uh, to to do a difficult task. So this is this beginning of civilization. You know, like we then we have uh, tribes, villages, and then you know like city, city, state, countries. You know, so so this is this is how we do things. Uh, and uh, so I think a lot of focus uh, on Dao. It's about governance. Uh, governance is obviously uh, very important uh, because people need to agree, right? If they can't need to agree on a set of like uh, common rules, or you know, the the code wouldn't be able to be carried, right? Because you know, in the decentralized system, you still need individual uh, nodes to execute the uh, the code, and if they don't agree, the code wouldn't be executed. And you don't have a blockchain. You don't have a DAO. So. So, so to differentiate, uh, you know, something we human do this way, uh, and also something like, uh, like happens naturally in nature, uh, we notice that a lot of things are just happening, right? And they don't need uh, to put a note. So, uh, you know, ex- you know, outside of human uh, endeavor, uh, a lot of things naturally happen in nature, uh, life. You know, for example, uh, they don't need a vote to do. Uh, to do, you know, carry on their business. So, so, uh, so another aspect of, a, a, you know, DAC versus uh, versus the uh, the intuitive understanding uh, or naive understanding of DAO is that uh, is there anything that we can, you know, uh, achieve and outside of just uh, moving our, you know, societal structure uh, from a uh, like human-based law to a machine-based law, right? So uh, so I think uh, the uh, vision of DAC economy is to, uh, let's find a way to do things on blockchain that probably beyond, outside of uh, just like 
uh, you know, governments, you know, by taking votes. So, um, so this this is this is the way to talk about value, right? So, value is actually uh, in the blockchain is actually uh, another kind of boundary uh, because you know if you have a different coin, different blockchain, then uh, you can't agree, right? So even if you have bridges, right, the agreement is weaker on the on their native blockchain uh, for each one. So, uh, so what we wanted. To what we want to achieve is a kind of like a structure that outside, uh, you know, our, our ways to make every decision by a vote because that would be very uh, inefficient because a lot of things we carry on in life uh, don't take a vote, right? Um, so how, how do we agree on something uh, that's, you know, need to uh, have a consensus? So so this is, this is you know, uh, you have to do is to you find ways to uh, to have a consensus on value that don't you know don't naturally need a vote. And what are those things? Uh, those things probably uh, would be um, you know what you can let it happens uh, like naturally. Uh, for example, when you produce something, uh, you don't need to you know take a vote. So a lot of you know uh, work of business people carrying in life uh, don't don't need a vote every time. So we call this uh, management DAO, which is correspond to our uh, .com, right? Uh, instead of like a .core, uh, because, you know, like, uh, you know, what a corporation do is they have a, a very central centralized uh, governance structure, right? You have a, a board of directors, a board meeting. Uh, yes, they take notes, but, you know, they, they can't, they can't manage a business uh, by you know uh, by the board right they need other people uh, to carry on their tasks and uh, what about them right and uh, and this I think this is what like Vitalik uh, kind of mentioned in one of his talks in uh, I think this is the keynote uh, in this uh, the recent East Denver conference about high frequency uh, activities right so so these are things uh, so we're interested we're interested about. And, and uh, in this space, um, a new kind of uh, value, meaning that, you know, we're going to, you know, pursue the kind of functionalities or activities that, uh, that outside of like, uh, like vote mostly like on blockchain, this coin vote. So uh, he also mentioned that, you know, a lot of people actually don't think coin vote is a, as a you know, it's, it's so convenient and a lot of people actually hate it. Um, so in this space, there's a lot to be, uh, to be ex explored. And, uh, and, and this is, you know, uh, that economy is also uh, going to explore. Thank you. <laughs> I was struggling with my mute there. Um, so what do you think, I mean, there are so many applications and things that we could take, like rabbit holes that we could dive into and, and stay in for forever. But just a general overview of how this structure could be utilized for different types of organizations, I think might be helpful for um, putting this in perspective for people. Um, what, let's do both of you, but let's start with Pavel. Could you give maybe an idea of what what this could like practically look like for different types of organizations. Sure. In terms of a DAC, I guess I, I'm going to go for the perspective of a decentralized autonomous company. So I know that there's a, uh, oh, sorry, corporation. Nah, should have thought. <laughs> My mistake. So I'm going to go for the perspective of a decentralized autonomous corporation. I know that we have a decentralized autonomous company, which is, I guess, two different structures and two different perceptions. I guess in, in terms of how the implementation would look like for a decentralized autonomous corporation, it would be the processes and procedures that an individual makes is very important, it's very key. And in the sense of a corporation, there is a lot of responsibility that goes in for a, a CEO 
a CFO, a CIO. There's a lot of C-level executives that have this responsibility on delivering value to the stakeholders. So whether it be the actual customers or the investors or the any any other people that are involved directly with the corporation. As such, there is that responsibility and there is that trust that you would put into the operation of a corporation. In terms of the implementation on how that would look like, I would say that the earliest form of a decentralized autonomous corporation would be the East, East India Trading Company, where they had a lot of stakeholders, they had a lot of investors, and they had a lot of operational, I would say, a, a, lot, of, a lot of what was based in there had a lot of that organizational structure already created. And so in this case, it's, it's very traditional in, in, in that sense, you know, the East Indian Trading Company was like in the 1500s or even earlier. Um, and in that aspect, a lot of the business processes that were created back then are still utilized today after the Industrial Revolution and after modern, modernization of, um, of uh, the, the taxes and, and tax code, the SEC, of getting involved into, into um, corporations, public companies, and, and, and so on and so forth. So I would say that a decentralized autonomous corporation would be similar to a public, uh, a public corporation today, where you have a list of stakeholders, you have a list of a board of directors that are responsible for the operation of the entity that they are operating. So in this case, if I am running a tech company, I, I as the CIO, the chief um, information officer, I'm responsible for the specific uh, operations that my team has, is, is doing. And so as such, I'm responsible for the deliverables. I'm responsible for the operations of that, that what is expected of me. If I am not fulfilling my obligation, if I'm not fulfilling my duty, then it's up to the C-level executives or even the, the people that control the shares to vote me in or out or replace me. So in that sense, it would be very similar to a, how a traditional corporation would, would operate in terms of a publicly, publicly funded. Uh, in, in, in this case, now, since it's, since it's public, the idea of a blockchain is that, is that it's open, it's transparent, it's verifiable. A lot of the same principles can apply to the regular business world where you have to, if you're a public company, depending on where you're regulated or where we lo you're located at, you have to provide financial reports every quarter or biannually or annually or basically as, as you're legally required to do so. As such, we the, since blockchain is transparent by default, a lot of the processes and a lot of the finances can easily be tracked and easily be listed and filtered and and in this case uh, hiring expensive accountants hiring expensive people that would go over auditors and, and to look over all of the financial reports for your business that that cost is now reduced because it's all tracked on a public ledger so a lot of the business processes and a lot of the cost savings from transitioning over to a more actually decentralized autonomous corporation could uh, could be beneficial for corporations that have hundreds of thousands of transactions and need to take through you know, two months of, of basically you know, taking a look and balancing the books and making sure that everything is there. Um, in, in this in this sense. We see it as a cost-saving opportunity, 
and in this case it's a, it's a way to also so it's a way to save money but it's also a way to make money in the sense that uh, now you're not limited by the specific region that your company a corporation is located so right now if you want to start a corporation if you want to start any type of business you are limited geographically for the region that you're in and you might be limited in in terms of your your budgets and uh, to do international business when you, know, you just started your your corporation is is uh, is, is a very big risk in, in this case since it's decentralized since it is a decentralized autonomous corporation you're able to create it and you're able to interact with anyone from anywhere in the world and provide that that value in a globalized space so in this sense you're not you're no longer limited by by the financial burden of expanding into different districts and you can do business irrespective of, of borders that you're in going back to the question on how that implementation would look like so first would be that ability to track that financial data in a transparent way but also a way that you can easily interact with any any decentral any anyone in in that decentralized space so so i i would i would imagine just as a practical example fiverr is is a good example now fiverr of uh, you know, operate in, in, in a more uh, open way. So you you do have people, uh, by the way, Fiverr is, is just a way that people can request to do anything online on their platform. And, you know, you pay $5 and you get that thing that you requested. So having that and expanding that business model and concept to all organizations in ways that, uh, for example, open source code has been a very, very big revolution and has changed the, I would say, a lot of the enterprise level businesses have adopted open source as their key, um, I wouldn't say key business model, but have adopted open source and are contributing to it. You look at Google and the Android ecosystem, you look at, uh, you look at uh, Apple and 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 its um, and its uh, Maps application. You you look at um, you look at um, in this case the and and also the CUPS, which is uh, basically this open standard for uh, printing functionality that Apple also has has taken a look at. Uh, you also look at the Microsoft and and uh, Microsoft now loves open source. Um, you know they they bought up GitHub and and uh, Node Package Manager, but they're emphasizing open source. Unfortunately, open source is heavily underfunded, and a lot of it is is just hobby projects or hobby, um, you know, things that you would do in your free time. And maybe you would have a Patreon page, or you'd have a place where people would come in and, and provide that value in their free time. But being paid for providing open source code is very difficult. In this case, um, another use case. For that would be a lot of co or a lot of corporations can open up their open source developments to the community and put bounties on specific issues in 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 their GitHub. They can say that oh we need this functionality. If someone can provide it, they would get you know, x amount of of dollars in, in in this case. And 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 the way that you would do it right now and in it's, it's very difficult, but utilizing a decentralized autonomous corporation structure, you can easily put those bounties and have ways that, that people can contribute to that open source code and be paid for it. In, in this case, making it more sustainable for people to, to come in and to contribute in, in that way. And we've seen this in DAOs already, We've seen this in decentralized autonomous organizations where people are able to contribute their resources and be paid for it. But in this case, uh, a decentralized autonomous corporation is, is more of a set structure. You can set how much each bounty would be paid for. You can set how the, you know, the, the processes of, of uh, you know, what the requirements for, for, each, uh, for each task would be. 
essentially making it more standardized and easier to track in in a in terms of a uh, financial perspective. So the, those those types of interactions that you would do again, it would be all open, all transparent, and it can run without any individual operation. All it is is just how many how many bounties I want to put out, and it the bounties get paid out if the person has completed it uh, sufficiently to the you know the code compiles and, and everything is present within there. Um, and in this case, this can mean this can mean a lot of the developer, a lot of the developers that companies have to, that corporations have to hire, would now be more so can can be offloaded into the, into the contractor space, and so people can uh, do work based on individual jobs rather than being in salaried positions, where they might not have their efforts fully utilized or the ability that you need to micromanage employees to make sure that they do the the work that is provided. Uh, and then that eliminates the whole burden of, of stress or involvement for both the individual that is now being micromanaged and as well as the the corporation which which uh, or the manager that is, that is uh, is, is micromanaging those people. So in this case, this make, makes it more of a um, more of a equitable and less of a. It gives essentially an option for people to come in and provide their resources in, in their time in their way. And we've seen this with Uber, where now people are able to control their hours. You know, some people would want to work at 2 a.m. and and can and you know drive people around then. But in this case. And the same can be applied into the decentralized ecosystem, and so this this is uh, this is I guess how the implementation might look like, as well as my my overall thoughts for uh, for that. Nice, thank you. Um, and just to be clear for anyone listening, open source code means that it's available; like people can go in and look at it and collaborate on it. Correct. That's correct. Yes. So anybody can come in, anybody can contribute, and and it's there's different types of open source licenses that are that are out there. There's the MIT, there's the BSD, there's the um, uh, GPL. So they all have their own nuances in, in terms of uh, the MIT. That's the I would say the least restrictive license. All you have to do is include that as part of their. Um, uh, you just include the license, and then you're free to use it for any type of purpose. Uh, the BSD is, is, is a similar license, and but the GPL is more so that you cannot, um, you, you can gain a profit, but there is some restrictions that are made. For example, that the code has to be, in that case, open source. It has to be like available to everyone. Any changes that you do make has to be tracked and, and present and open. And uh, although, again, you can make a profit profit out of it, you still have to display the code and anybody can download and contribute and view. So there is some nuances for that, but I think that all open source licenses have that place in, in, in which anybody can come in, anybody can see, anybody can contribute, and anybody can use. And some, some are more restrictive in, in terms of the usage, uh, but the principle is the same: is that anybody can see its transparency, and um, and uh, it, the licenses all differ based on in the, in, in the case of where you can use it. Uh, but yeah, yeah, that's that's in a sense what what open source uh, code is. Cool, thank you. Yeah, there's this whole um, a whole new set of vocabulary that that comes with being introduced to this space. So if you're not a developer, um, also a bounty, I'll just explain is just essentially when a group says like, we want people to review this code to help with this function or to look for a bug or any of those things. So people can receive money for collaborating on a project in that way. Um, so if those are new terms for you, that's what that means. Um, Ming, do you want to expand any on, on that vision for how a DAC structure can be utilized? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, actually, let me, let me, uh, um, get a charger cause my, uh, my phone is like only, uh, 10%. So, 
yeah, yeah. yeah. Take your time. Just, yeah, just yeah, just ten seconds. Yeah. Cool. In the meantime, I will serenade everyone. No, I won't. Just kidding. <laughs> How about you, Ken? Do you have any jokes? Sure. Um, also, I might want to clarify one thing. Apple okay. Maps might not be open source. I'm not actually quite sure. I know that I know that um, they're used by things like DuckDuckGo, the official map provider. Um, but I'm not sure if they are open source in that case. Uh, although, you know, I could be wrong in, in, in both regards. Um, because I guess I guess I, you know, I use DuckDuckGo and I'm like, ah, you know, DuckDuckGo is just, you know, pretty. I think the reason why they use it is is because it's more so that Apple has has um, been more vocally private than than Google Maps in in that case. So there there might be less data that's that's being tracked uh, from every user. So that's maybe the reason why they're using it. But um, there might still be that those those licenses, and it might not be fully you know, open source in that case. Although again, I could be wrong. But I I knew that I know that CUPS, um, which is like the the uh, basically, the printing service that Apple has created is open source. It's, it's used by uh, a lot of the Linux distributions as a means to print uh, documents in in a way that's that's open, and you don't have to have the specific uh, drivers for because the drivers are already batched together. But anyways, that's that's something that I wanted to clarify. I see that 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 Ming has has uh, almost everything set up there, uh, but yeah, yeah. I could talk for hours on open source as well. That's that's uh, something that really uh, really cool and interesting, um, at least for me. <laughs> Some people might be uh, might be falling asleep, and <laughs> but uh, but I can definitely you know talk for hours on uh, on just that. Right. Yeah. Well, we'll uh, we'll, re- we'll return to that in a in a future episode, perhaps, so that you mm-hmm. can get your rocks off on open source code. <laughs> Go ahead, me. Yeah, sure. Actually, um, I'm, you know, a uh, engineer, so I, um, I, I am not like, coding as much as I do before. Um, but I love open source. Uh, this, I think, is the uh, the single most uh, important uh, revolution in, in in the whole uh, uh, IT industry. So, um, but you know, if we uh, if we want to. Uh, you know, kind of dig deep into what a DAC, uh, uh, for DAC, I mean like DAC core, um, I'm sorry, uh, .com, which is decentralized kind of company, could do uh, in a maybe a parallel universe uh, that's in addition to what we already have, uh, the structures like a corporation, is actually, I think, the uh, one of the licenses, this is very interesting, that uh, Pavel mentioned the uh, GPL, right? The G- GPL is a very interesting uh, license uh, because it has a mechanism, right? It's, it's almost like a smart contract uh, that it has a, uh, let's say, a incentive mechanism built in that if you want to use this code, you have to contribute back. This is a very interesting idea. Uh, you know, of course, um, in corporations, um, people like people love like BSD or MIT because you know you don't need to uh, contribute back; you can close it off, which which is okay. I think the uh, you know the idea of uh, open source is that you can do whatever you want with the code without restriction. So yeah, it's all good, but GPL is good in a different way. Uh, so I think this is a benevolent. Uh, a force in the open source, uh, you know, a movement. So without GPL, right? Uh, I, I don't, I don't think, you know, if you just have a BSD or MIT kind of license, uh, because if everybody closes off, so then we will contribute back to the open source, uh, you know, code base, then the whole sphere would just wizard away, right? So this brings us back to uh, what DAC and economy is all about. So it's about uh, the human endeavor, right? So what we do in life um, is actually driven uh, by our, uh, you know, uh, 
individual, let's say individual volition, right? We want to live, uh, we want to live a good life. Uh, we have our reasons to do this or that and you know, carry on our lives. So incentives are an economics uh, term, but it's very uh, important uh, in our you know, social life, right? Societal, right? You do things uh, with certain incentive. The incentive might not be monetary, right? So what drives people to social media every day? To tweet like 100 times every day, right? So um, it might not be money. And in a lot of cases, actually, uh, uh, you know, on the opposite of uh, money, right? So, so the, the reason why we, we want to uh, promote uh, a very decentralized uh, ec economy uh, we need a structure that would that would be able to capture all kind of incentives, not just monetary incentives, right? So if you uh, have only one kind of incentives, right? For example, in the open source movement, then yeah, so corporation would just close off, uh, you know, all these uh, contributions that nobody would contribute, right? So uh, so we need uh, to be able to actually uh, keep the light on, right? So who, who, who's going to pay for people who's coding just for fun or just, you know, just for whatever incentive they have, you know, uh, I mean, by that, I mean, like, not to earn a salary, you know, some people just love coding, uh, someone to help, you know, their cause, uh, you know, all kinds of, like, uh, incentives. And I think all incentives uh, should be uh, well represented uh, in a, in, in any economy, right? So, our current economy, unfortunately, um, mostly, you know, unfortunately, right, mostly just rewards, uh, you know, monetary drives, monetary, uh, you know, activities, right? So, you know, for a lot of people, if you don't have uh, a paying job, you wouldn't be able to do the things, um, you know, that you think is important to you, right? If you like coding, but if you can't find a job that pays, then it's a hobby, right? And probably a lot of people, especially not just in the open source, you know, community, but also like for a lot of like artists. So this brings another important, I think, trend in, in the blockchain sector. Uh, a lot of people probably heard of NFT, right? NFT helped a lot of uh, artists to make a living, but you know, that's just, that's just like something, uh, you know, uh, in the news. But in the reality, like, you know, a lot of artists still don't make, uh, you know, you know, money, right? Like 80% of the money made uh, in the art space as in any of these kind of cre creator space uh, is by like very few people. This is like, uh, this is, uh, people call it the, the power distribution law, uh, the, the 80 20 but in, in a lot of cases it's not 80 20 right it's like 99 percent versus one percent so probably a very small cluster of people made like uh, most of money uh, in the space so what we could do to capture the kind of uh you know human endeavor uh, their various incentives other than monetary uh, you know drives or incentives uh, to help a a prosper economy uh, that you know purely uh, you know come out of people's creation. So this is this is you know I think a company, uh, I mean decentralized autonomous company could help. Uh, so you know uh, we probably you know could go into more aspects of it, but let me let me just give you uh, like one or two examples of the things that you know. Uh, we can go beyond a monetary uh, incentive. Um, if, when we when we talk about uh, you know rewarding uh, creation, we have to understand the, the nature of creation, right? So creation is a kind of activity that's kind of uh, generates value in a different way than um, the, the kind of value, uh, for example, like money represents, right? So money, you know, if, if you want to deal with money, uh, you have to have very strict uh, zero sum roles, or you have to have accounts. You have to have people to manage the accounts, right? You have to make the calculation right. Somebody takes uh, one dollar out, then you have to balance it, right, with a uh, I, with a you know uh, account, right? So this is this is this is the way um, the value the money represents. But on the other side, the uh, creation kind of value 
is, um, for example, is generated, right? So if I give you something I created, you know, I don't lose, you know, I, I don't like take one off for myself. I still have it, right? So this is this is very different kind of kind of value uh, uh, dynamics. So uh, that company wants to, you know, kind of capture this kind of, uh, uh, you know, value system, value dynamics. So you know, we could use uh, because you know everything's on blockchain and and with programs with smart contracts, we can program it. We can have different uh, kind of you know uh, generative uh, algorithms uh, for people to capture this kind of value uh, dynamics, value creation and distribution. Um, and we actually have this kind of uh, value uh, uh, economics, right? In in you know already in our current economy. It's just not very, uh, you know, intuitive, uh, you know, that people actually ac access to it, right? So most likely uh, when you deal with uh, value creation, right, it's very simple, right? Uh, you do exchanges and these are all like zero sum, right? You, you don't, you know, when you uh, deal with creation, it's kind of difficult, right? That's why a lot of, you know, these creators uh, can't make money because the, the current economic system uh, aren't very well in dealing with this kind of uh, value generation value dynamics. But, uh, but I think with the uh, uh, rise of blockchain uh, and smart contracts and uh, algorithmic uh, you know, transactions, uh, we, we can change this, right? So uh, we, we, we talked about art and uh, another, you know, I think uh, people sh sh could understand very intuitively is uh, what we call like uh, 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 reputation power, right? In social media, reputation power is um, is very important, right? It, people know it's not money, right? Uh, people can have a lot of reputation power, um, but you know they can't just uh, create it by dumping a lot of money, right? And sometimes you know a, a viral um, tweet. Um, you know, you can't just pay for a viral tweet. You know, everybody knows that. It must come from some combination of ingenuity and uh, people's, you know, creation and sometimes just luck, right? So this is this is not something that can be captured really well um, by uh, by the zero sum kind of value that we uh, our current economy actually uh, deals with. Um, so to uh, but but these are actually also value, right? Uh, you know the power of reputation. So, um, but right now these, uh, the benefits uh, of the reputation power is mostly captured um, by big like social media platforms, right? So, you know, you want, you have that revenue power, but it's not yours. It belongs to the platform. If you're uh, kicked out of that platform, your reputation power just, uh, you know, just vaporize, right? Um, so I think this is this is also this is an area like DAC economy, um, you know, as the second revolution, uh, revolution of blockchain is all about, right? So of course we revolutionize finance. Now it's time we revolutionize uh, the creator economy. So yeah, so we can have these uh, very kind of small dynamics, uh, you know, cycles uh, that drives people, right? These incentives, the micro incentives. Uh, this is why we talk, we talk about you know man, man DAO, uh, because you know it's uh, you know it, it, when you when you work this way when you work carry on your business, right? These these micro incentives uh, actually are not driven by the the kind of economic uh, the zero sum kind of uh, value system that we have today. That's why when you see even within an organization, right? You can't have everyone to have an account to deal with your colleagues, to deal with your customers, right? So the uh, the value system that we have in our current economy is kind of heavy, right? It's cumbersome, right? So and and that's why we create uh, organization in the first place, uh, even like corporations uh, to manage like uh, you know employees, uh, manage customers, but of course they're still they're still heavy, right? Um, in in that com, uh, in individual central uh, centric uh, BC, uh, we can have a very light uh, incentive, you know, um, multiplex of incentives that can be managed algorithmically 
and they can gen also have a, a reasonable expected uh, generative uh, system to uh, to generate values for uh, people. So all their creations uh, can be recycled, right? Can be uh, redistributed, can be you know injected uh, into the uh, the everyday lives. Uh, that people carry on every day. So I think this is the vision that economy um, is uh, is all about. Uh, and uh, it's I think it's a um, at first it can be a comp you know uh, you know complementary to uh, that core to uh, the corporation right that streamline it you know reduce the cost but also complement it. But I I think in the future right when we you know have the investment in you know even more automation. And uh, we give, you know, the, the the power of automation back to the individuals. I think this 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 these parts of the economy could dwarf dwarf the, the kind of like uh, fixed economy, um, you know, uh, we have today. That's kind of heavy and uh, cumbersome. So uh, yeah, of course, this this is the vision. So we're just um, getting started. Uh, but I'm very excited that uh, uh, you know we can harvest, collect uh, people's creation and not let them just uh, wither, right? So, yeah, so so I think this is, this is what we, uh, uh, you know, we talk about uh, dark economy and, and its future. Yeah, of course, we just get started. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. I love the idea of considering value beyond just, you know, currency um, because I think that's kind of a, I mean, it's a limiting factor. It's a heaviness that I think everybody feels. And maybe it's been for a long time, but especially in the past couple of years, people are talking more about that. And they're not really driven by um, like monetary motivation. There's this deeper desire to feel like, um, you know, creativity can be expressed and valued. And um, I think people are motivated by greater freedom and a connection and feeling like, the work that they're doing is meaningful and contributing to something that's larger than themselves. So having these tools and an economy that values different types of input, I think would not only just ease that burden on people, but also start to change the way that we focus our energies when we create and also when we learn. Um, so, so much can come from that even beyond just the products themselves, but in the way that we consider the way that we spend our time and our energy as people. Um, I think it could foster some greater connections and um, stronger communities, which is really exciting. So I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing where we go with this. And I know that the focus of, of Metis is to really build out the functionality and, and the tools for the DAX as the year goes on. So our roadmap shows toward the end of this year, we'll have more options for people to actually start using these functions. So I'm excited about that. And we'll, we'll have some more episodes where we dive into this topic and, and talk a little bit more about where we're going from here. Um, but I want to thank you both so much for, for taking the time to chat with me today and for introducing this topic to our audience and Hopefully people can ask questions and uh, we can do another one of these where we answer those and then expand a little bit more. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop us recording unless anybody has any final remarks they want to add. Okay, cool. I'm stopping. No, nah, no nothing for me. Uh, but yeah. Cool.